this thing. So, welcome to Nap Tuesday. You guys are awesome. Um, it's going to be pretty fun, and this fun here today is happening because of our friends from Woodward's, the W2 Media Cafe. You'll see right here at the bottom of the slide, there's a little bit of a Twitter handle, which is, these people are really good to us, and a way that we can be good to them is to spread the word. So if you want to give them a little bit of online loving, a little bit of Twitter action, um, get on that. You say, but, but I'm not on the internet. Here. I got you guys covered. So uh, that thing's totally going to work. The password is double trouble, all lowercase. I'm going to give you guys maybe 10 more seconds on this slide, just so you can get that in. <laughs> I thought it's because it's based. <laughs> all right, there we go. Frantic fingers, all done. Double trouble. So, uh, yeah, we're Net Tuesday. We're on the internet. You can find us on Twitter. You can use the crazy hashtag, NTVAN, which today is actually how we're going to aggregate some of the questions that are coming in remotely because of our video streaming. And, uh, and we also got a fancy website. Things you should know, let me introduce myself. Hi there, my name's Eli. I can't see you because I'm staring into lights, but uh, I bet you're beautiful. So I've been doing this as a volunteer for the last three years, and this thing is Net Tuesday, which is basically a, let's bring together the nonprofit community with the online and technology communities. We smash you into a room, and usually good things come out of it. You should also know that the washrooms are out behind you in the hallway. Um, and uh, if this is your first time here and you haven't signed up on the meetup, you should totally go to the web page and put your name in the form. So as I said, Net Tuesday, it is a place where we bring these two communities together. Um, Net Tuesday comes out of something called TechSoup. Um, and what they do is they manage software donations for companies like Microsoft, SAP, Adobe. So, which is to say, if you work in a charitable nonprofit and you use software, you should really go check out TechSoup because you are going to get software for one tenth of its retail price. So, uh, don't spend real money. You should go check this stuff out. So it's not just me. Um, there are actually 50 of me scattered about the world. Um, and we're actually part of that network today. As a, so we will actually be streaming this event out to Honolulu and one other city whose name I've forgotten. But they'll probably tell me on Twitter. God bless them. So who's new here? Who's, like, very first time? Oh, nice. Which means actually the rest of you, the majority of you, are Grizzled Veterans. So welcome, Grizzled Veterans, and uh, thank you so much for coming again. That's a real vote of confidence. And to the newbies, we'll be around afterwards. If, you've other, if you have other questions, stop and say, like, hey, what's this thing all about? Because I'll be hanging out here until at least 8 o'clock today. So this thing is also volunteer run. I know that I've got at least four volunteers here today. So uh, I'm going to ask them to stand up because they're fabulous. Hey, Chad, stand up. Yeah. I've also got Calvin, who's here. And I know I've got Mirage. And I've got a brand new volunteer named Linda, who's running a camera. I'd like you just all give them a, a bit of applause because they're pretty great. So there are cameras all around here today. So uh, what that means is we're actually live streaming this event out into the world. And we are also going to be recording it so we'll eventually put it up on YouTube and make it all fancy. So you'll see there's a camera behind you, a camera to the side, and then we're also mixing in the slides. So I'm thinking we're going to have something pretty compelling by the end of it. And uh, Again, if you want to put questions in, because you guys are out there on the internet watching this live stream right now, use the hashtag NTVAN, and Chad in the back will actually collect those, and at the end, we'll bring in those questions. There's also a photographer. Hooray for photographers. If you are extremely shy, 
let me know afterwards and I'll make sure that you don't show up in a photo. Otherwise, you're going to be in a photo. So uh, say hello to Honolulu. And uh, if you want to actually talk to them through the magical Twitters, they both got hashtags. So we've got one for the Honolulu group. And we've also got one for Arthur, who is the leader in Honolulu. Hi there. Um, that's all I got for you today, unless I've got someone from W2. Is Erwin around? OK, he's not. But uh, basically, let me just say real quickly that being in this venue is a gift, and I'm so excited to be here. We've now been here for a full year using their space, and they donated that space, and I'm really quite thrilled about it. Um, we do have other costs, like these fancy cameras, so I do appreciate your donations at the door. But uh, if you don't have money, it's OK. I still love you. So uh, here we go, presenter time. We've got two of Vancouver's best people here, although Darren is questionably Vancouver these days, since he's off in fancy France. So uh, these people are master online community builders and marketers. They also are super friends to Net Tuesday, and so I'm so thrilled to bring you Darren Blairford and Theo Lamb. Come on up! Okay. Good evening, everybody. How are you? Good, good. Tim, Tim Walker taught me that. So, uh, I'm Darren. This is Theo. We work for a company called Capulet Communications. We're a web communications firm. We mostly do strategy these days, so occasionally we do programs. Um, these are some of the clients in the nonprofit or kind of social goody space that we work with on an ongoing basis. Um, I'm going to burn up a little bit uh, of the uh, karma futures here because we're, we're hopefully going to earn some karma from you over the next hour. Uh, but we just launched this project. Just like you're the first humans outside of the company to see it, outside of the organization to see it, which is kind of a photo contest slash, um, slash petition site called uh, Big Wild Big Water for Mount Kuma Co op. Uh, so please feel free to check it out later. It's going to look awful, I think, on iPads and, and <laughs> iPhones. We didn't. It was a small budget on this project. Um, but uh, it's kind of a cool site. It looks quite cool. I'm really happy with how the map turned out. Um, but if you want to kick, kick the tires on it, that'd be awesome, because we're going to be ruining it later in the week. And uh, if you break it in the next 24 hours, that'd be great. So we knew, and you could fix it before we promoted it anywhere. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, Theo and I, and Eli, too. And um, you're still here, so um, a bunch of us have just been to Web of Change. Has anybody else in the audience been to Web of Change for? Ah, Jay, you've been to Web of Change. You've been to Rob, you've been. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm talking about Web of Change because I think it's an amazing conference. And we all love it, and you should definitely consider going. Sometimes it's, um, it's kind of indescribable. That's part of its problem, actually. But it's this uh, great combination of personal and professional development amongst super smart senior digital strategists in the online space and also digital campaigners and offline campaigners. But we were there and we always uh, like think big thoughts and have big ideas and think strategy at Web of Change. Um, but we are about to acknowledge that this talk is actually not about strategy. It's down in the dirty, messy trenches of Facebook. Um, and so um, I just mentioned that because this, our data will hopefully inform your strategy as well as your day-to-day -day kind of tactical behavior. Um, but and it's important to have a conversation about strategy before you get into this. But today we're, we're down in the trenches. We're down in the World War I trenches of Facebook. So now on to the science, or as, as we like to say, hashtag science. Um, you know, Theo and I uh, and Capital have worked on the web for a long, long time. And as one does when one works in a space, one reads studies and looks at reports and earns, uh, gains experience and earns wisdom and so on and so forth about what works and what doesn't work online and in a channel like Facebook, for example. Um, but we never have really come to a, 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 had an opportunity to do research ourselves, to explore some specific questions, and look into the, the NGO, I'm going to call it NGO instead of having to say nonprofits and charity or charitable organizations, the NGO space really specifically. And so we took an opportunity to do some actual science here. 
And we, we asked these two questions. This is what we were kind of hoping to answer, right? First, what kind of content gets most engaged with online, right? Gets, and we measure engagement through likes, comments, and shares, right? What gets most engaged with? And who is doing really well? Who, is, who are um, the top performers in the space? Over to you. Okay. So we're going to tell you now what we did. Um, as uh, Darren likes to say, he likes to know who's killing it on Facebook. Um, and uh, we wanted to sort of back up our assertions and experience with actual data. So we set about uh, collecting tw uh, and looking at 20 different organizations, nonprofit organizations, environmental nonprofit organizations who are currently on Facebook. These are the 20 we looked at. We chose nonprofit, uh, environmental nonprofit, because that is a space we both work on, work in. We wanted to compare apples to apples. Uh, these organizations are, are fairly similar in the sense that they have the same fan base. So I think Darren was between 150 and 300,000 fans. Yeah, roughly. I think there's an average of 160,000 fans. Yeah, so we weren't looking for 1.5 million. We weren't looking for 10,000. We were trying to keep it, again, apples to apples. And you will recognize a lot of those names on there. Hopefully you're fans of uh, most of them. So we took, uh, we, we identified these 20 different organizations and uh, we started looking at their Facebook content. Uh, to be more specific, one organization, we looked at the 50 most recent posts they have done. And as we all know, a post is a link, a status update, a video, a photo, uh, a link back to your own website. And we uh, took those 50 posts, the URL to each post, um, which allows anybody to link back to that post, put it all in one place, and then took a really good close look at a tool called Mechanical Turk. Now, you may have heard Mechanical Turk. Um, I was introduced to it this year. It's uh, owned and run by Amazon.com. And Mechanical Turk is essentially what Darren likes to describe as a human computer. It allows anybody to put forward tasks um, and for those tasks to be distributed around the world to workers who are ready to accept, accept them. So you're crowdsourcing tasks. And it's really great for, you know, those, those minute data entry um, tasks that you need done at work. If you have large sets of data that you need to uh, uh, go through or divide up or identify. It's also really good at doing, uh, identifying things that computers aren't really good at identifying. So an example that Darren uh, uses is, do you have a thousand photos that you need to categorize? Like this is a photo of nature, this is a photo of an urban city, this is a photo of a home. The workers can do that for you better than a computer can right now. Uh, it's a great tool. Uh, a little kind of, a little tricky to use at first, um, but you get the hang of it. This is a typical post that we would have looked at. Now this is an example from the bigwall.org and we didn't compare the bigwall.org in this study. But you'll see, you'll recognize it. You, you know, you, you can see the name of the organization. There's a timestamp, so we know the date and we know the time that this uh, was posted. And that is actually essentially the URL that anybody can click. We know that it's a link to a new site outside of their own site, so in this case, cbc.ca. We can uh, see how many likes it has, how many shares it has, and how many comments it has. So that's what we were looking for, this kind of information. Whoops. So in Mechanical Turk, you have an opportunity to basically build a form uh, that is, that's the form that each worker, wherever they are in the world, will be interacting with. So they'll click on the URL that takes them to the Facebook post, and they'll be able to record date, time, likes, shares, comments. They plug all that information in, and then we get it all back. And this is what it looks like when you get it back. It's essentially, this is just a screenshot, but we, we received a thousand posts back because we were looking at 50 posts per organization, 20 different organizations. Um, it's great, it was a wonderful way to crowdsource a job that otherwise I probably would have had to do. Yeah, that would have been awful. <laughs> Is there anything you want to add there, Darren? Um, no, I, I think that's, um, that's exhaustive, yeah. Um, and we intentionally, some people have asked, like, well, why didn't you pick smaller organizations like the ones most of us work with? And, and you know, we just wanted um, 
to not bias the data set by having too small little data sets, you know. And so we, if you have a lot of people, you're likely to get the kind of same levels of engagement across the board and that sort of thing. So again, it was the apples to apples angle there. Yeah. yeah. Check out Mechanical Turk, it's pretty cool. Yeah, Mechanical Turk is kind of amazing. It's, it's, it's kind of amazing, you've got a bunch of discrete tests. Uh, by the way, we're gonna, because of the live stream stuff, we'll just take questions at the end in case anyone has one, just make a note of it burn in a hole in your pocket. So next we have some observations. These are not things we um, assessed or applied any kind of uh, layer of analysis over. This is just some stuff we saw, right? I think this is a very illustrative slide. I will have more on this later. So we categorized every single one of the thousand posts by its type, right? You'll recognize most of these types. As photo, photo gallery, status, status, video, uh, video. And then there are links, and there are two kinds of links. Links to the organization's own site. So if you're WWF Canada, you link back to www.ca, I think is their URL. Uh, links to their own site, which are there in blue, and notably the largest slice of the pie. And then um, links to any other site on the web are the red, okay? So, you know, what we see here is that 37% uh, of all links go back to their own website. 26% uh, are photos. 17, 18% go to other sites, and on and on. Um, we'll do, dig into this more in the analysis section. And this is what the days of the week look like. This isn't that surprising. Um, you know, if you look at any data set about Facebook usage and Facebook posting, it'll look something like this. Um, I, I think probably Friday would, would, you know, on average, if we looked at 10,000 or 100,000 posts, this would average out a bit, and Friday would be higher, um, and Saturday might be a bit higher too. But um, yeah, this is, this is just strictly, we're gonna talk about some analysis of this stuff in a minute, but these are just things we learned just by looking at the data, straight up. This is what people are doing, not necessarily what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so other facts, right? Uh, not surprisingly, likes are a lot more common than shares and comments. So interestingly, shares are more common than comments, right? That was a surprise to us. Um, you can read the rest of this here. Um, on average, across the thousands, or across the NGOs, they posted on average once every day. More on that later. There was no obvious correlation between a day of the week and a post's popularity, right? So posts on Wednesday didn't do better. You can find lots of studies on this, um, uh, and they often conflict with each other, so you kind of need to test for yourself. Almost nobody, I think we may have found one Facebook question, which is like a little survey tool on a Facebook page. We found, uh, I think we found one in a thousand posts. And so almost nobody uses Facebook questions, which is interesting. And then um, this is super important. I think the last one here, that 18 of the top 20 posts out of the thousands, 18 of the top 20 were photos. Or images, I should say, not strictly photos. Um, this is still me, right? So then, so now we're into kind of what we figured out, right? We took all that data, those are some observations, and now we actually did some thinking about it. First, we made up a we made up a metric, like any good <laughs> firm, like any good analyst firm. We're not really an analyst firm, but this is what analyst firms do. They make up you know capital letter metrics like engagement. Um, but we needed a way to to uh, think about what um, you know what the most engaging content was. And you know we went and talked to a bunch of our peers, and everybody agreed that a like was less valuable than a comment, and a comment was less valuable than a share. And it also reflected less engagement, right? Super easy to like something, you just click a link where to write a comment, you have to comment, and then to share, you have to basically, you know, you don't have to, but almost always people um, write content in that share as well as sharing with their group. So it was a much higher engagement. So we did this math. Um, as it happens, if you remove these, um, these factors here and you just go likes plus comments plus shares, the top posts largely remain the top posts. The order gets mixed up a little bit but we actually didn't impact the results that very much by, by kind of doing this weighting. And then of course, just for the sake of for any of the statisticians who are in the room and laughing at me, I'm sorry, I'm more armchair statisticians. Um, the other thing that we did of course is we divided that by the current friend count for the whole group, because obviously a group with 500,000 friends is gonna have on average more likes per post than a group of 100,000. So we, um, we uh, normalized that, that data as well. Um, so with that in mind, we had a bunch of findings that I, I thought were um, illustrative, and some may, may surprise you, and some will not surprise you at all. Um, so the red line here is the count, right? How frequently um, organizations posted different kinds of data or different kinds of content. 
and then the uh, blue is the level of engagement for them. Okay, so here's uh, links to their own website. Okay, so they posted a lot of links to their own website, which is not surprising, but the actual performance of those links in terms of engagement was relatively low. Also not surprising, right? This is, you know, uh, for years we've been talking about um, something we call the cocktail party rule. And it's, it's like this, if you and I meet at a cocktail party and I talk to you about um, uh, how awesome I am, right, for like a half hour and I talk about the awesome trip I just went on and the awesome whatever trousers I'm wearing, <laughs> trousers, yeah, yeah, you're gonna like, wow, think, wow, what a douche, right? You're gonna walk away. But if instead, if instead I, I compliment on your cool shoes, and um, I, I recommend a restaurant around the corner that's great, and I talk to you about a play that I just saw, and um, I, uh, this sounds creepy, but I deliver value to you, right? Then, um, then that's a great, that's a much more efficient approach, and that's what we. We often advise companies, organizations, when they're talking online, whatever the channel, whether it's not their own website, but in email, in social media, elsewhere, to you know, talk 80% about other stuff and 20% about themselves, right? And so this is evidence that most organizations don't do that because it's hard and unnatural, right? They're used to talking about themselves. Anyway, you can see the other numbers along here, the other statistics, um, photo, um, you know, the, count, the engagement on photos is super high, as we'll show you. Um, there are actually very few status updates as a slice of the whole pie, too, which is interesting, which I think is a good thing because I, I think they're pretty boring. Uh, and now over to you. So um, I always like to say this is one of my favorite slides. These are the 20 organizations that we looked at. And uh, when you list them and stack them, you can see the organizations on the left are the ones that uh, had the that performed the best. Don't, don't look too hard at, at yeah, the organizations on the right. No, we're not trying to diss them. Right. We're not going to call them out. It's just one data set. We don't want to really. We, I really kind of hoped it would be too small, but the screens are quite large here, so you can you really try to read the organizations. And it was, it was sort of one of the findings that surprised me. We looked at all of these posts for at least a second as we were copying them over from Mechanical Turk. Uh, just, uh, we're going to get into more detail about those sort of top three organizations who are killing it on Facebook. But um, they, I mean, they really are when you look at it uh, all together. What is this one? This one, content types by NGO. Okay, so again, these are the 20 organizations, again, the most successful on the left, uh, not so successful on the right, and the kind of content they're posting. So uh, just a, a qu at a quick glance, um, blue represents uh, every time that they linked back to their own organizational website. Uh, red is another site, so it could be a new site in cbc.ca. Uh, I believe yellow, green, that's green, is photo, purple, photo gallery. Uh, blue, light blue was a status update, and then orange was the video. Um, if you look really closely, it starts to get interesting. Uh, looking at the organizations on the far left versus the far right, who's um, posting more of what and what they're not posting a lot of at all. We just wanted to take a closer look at photo and video because we sort of know, and I think a lot of people in this room know, that photos and videos perform well when we post them on Facebook. Uh, sort of take a look at the difference and the balance between those. And again, there's not, it evens out towards the end. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that a little, the message a little bit of these last slides is not that there's like some magic bullet yeah. combination that's going to work, right? There's um, less variability in the top performers, but I, I don't think, um, you know, um, we're going to give you some recommendations, you know, that seem well founded in the evidence and have been proved out in practice, but um, it's not like a perfect science. This is another one that looks at uh, links. Anybody who is linking to an organizational website, so their own home, back to the mothership, versus outside of their website to a new site, to someone else's site, a partner's site. Yeah, so I think this one is quite indicative because, as you can tell, it's kind of my bug there. But this is um, own site, other sites, own site, other sites, own site, other site. The top five, right, they're almost neutral, right? They, they link as often to other sites as not. And then if you look at the second half over there of the sites, right, there's a lot of um, really tall blue lines and quite short little red lines. That is a lot of photos right there. Um, this is kind of interesting, the number of posts they put up um, per week, and in some cases we looked at per day as I was pulling them again from Facebook. I came across some organizations that were posting the highest number was seven posts in one day, and, yeah, yeah. but they had huge fan counts, so I thought, well, this will be interesting to see how, what this turns into. Uh, again, looking at those top three organizations, pretty balanced, pretty level, and uh, then it's going to get a little more interesting. 
So yeah, you know, um, we presented this data originally on that square camp, uh, as Eli said, in the spring. Uh, thanks. And um, since then, we've found a couple other reports that um, have kind of uh, backed up this data, right? This is from a company called Wildfire. You may have heard of them. They're like a Facebook contest site. They were recently acquired by Google, I think. They were recently acquired by Google. And sorry, can you go back one for me? All right. Um, um, and, and so this is just a wildfire uh, engagement report, I think, a Facebook engagement report they put out. And so for causes or communities, again, you'll find that photos, this is like the percentage of, in their report, um, percentage of fans who engage with a particular kind of content. And so photos and video are really high there. Um, thanks. What is, what is going on there? Hang on. Maybe some sort of technical foible where the... Uh, Hmm. Bear with us a second. In Honolulu. Oh yeah, calm, remain calm, Honolulu. <laughs> Take a moment. I know it's late there. That's weird. Hang on, I'm just going to advance this. Advance this there. Okay, we're good. And we're back. Um, and this was a really interesting slide in the sense that it was, um, they looked at, this is not something we looked at, and we could have, but they looked at the number of characters in the caption or description per content type. Okay, that's uh, a little nerdy, but the idea here is that green is good and red is bad. So for a photo, um, like a mid-length caption is good, long is bad. Uh, for a status update, long is good. For a link, long is good. For a video, long is good. And the reason they were doing this, the, um, the lesson they extracted here is that lots of organizations you know, use Hootsuite or another tool to post simultaneously to Facebook and Twitter. But the point is, for all but a or, well, all the content types, um, a longer a longer caption than is allowed in Twitter works better. All right. So the lesson here is: write a different caption, or write a different description, or a different um, blurb, text, whatever we're going to call it, for Facebook than you should for Twitter. Right? Like post those separately because if you're using a tool and trying to be efficient, you're um, you're going to lose quality on the Facebook side. So that was an interesting insight that we did not discover. And finally, this is HubSpot. HubSpot, um, whether you like their inbound marketing tool, they have an amazing blog and wonderful research, really interesting stuff. And this is part of an infographic they put out just the other day. And, and this is about kind of social, social media engagement. And again, um, you can see here that videos, sorry, can you back up there? Yeah. Um, videos are um, 12, times, uh, 12 times more popular than links and posts and photos are, are, are likes twice as often, right? So again, as uh, the, the kind of si the thing we're hearing over and over again, photos and videos perform well. Well, we admired. So we uh, decided to take those top organizations, those top three organizations, and show you examples of the top performing posts that we actually looked at. And they all have a lot in common. So this was the number one performing post that we looked at. It uh, was built and created by an organization called Surfrider, a nonprofit organization based in the United States uh, around ocean uh, conservation. It's great. It's, it's evocative. It has a call to action. It's got text on it, but it also has a, an image that they created, so it's original, that, you know, sort of makes you feel a certain way. And certainly if you're a fan, it had really high engagement numbers as far as comments, likes, and shares were concerned. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, and this, again, is from Surfrider. Surfrider owns the number one and the number two spot overall of all thousand posts we looked at. Um, and this is a, on, was posted on, anyone can guess what day this was posted on? Valentine's Day, thank you, yeah. Um, so, you know, ooh, themes, theme stuff. I'm not gonna you know, claim that the theme helped, but I'm sure it did. Um, quite a simple image, no text on top of this one, but again, super high performed. Uh, this is uh, by 350.org, another really admirable organization that we like to watch uh, on Facebook. They do interesting and good things. They created this graphic. It, it's essentially an infographic. It, it's, con it, it's presenting um, uh, data in a really simple and um, aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing way. It doesn't have to contain a lot of information. I think that's what we want you to take away. It, again, it's got the call to action, it has the text, it has the image, and it's really simple and easy to look at. Uh, 350, also, go ahead. Uh, 350 also makes some fantastic 
videos, particularly wrap-up videos after uh, they've had offline events. I always find them super inspiring and, and worth drawing upon. And, and they're also really good at thanking um, people who take online action and identifying them. Yeah, Joe Solomon, does he still still work at 350 Eli? He's a barista now or something, isn't he? Yeah. Anyway, he, he always, they always, they used to thank, acknowledge one supporter every day on their social media channels. So whether that was like a volunteer or an organizer or just someone who had retweeted them, I think that's like a really good ethos to have of like giving that love away, right? Not talking about yourself, uh, making the, the, uh, your members or your supporters the heroes of your story, not yourself, right? Um, sidebar. Um, that's that I guess from a great book that I'm just reading right now. Have you started that book? No, not no. yet. Jonah Sachs, former Web of Change story guy. Wars. Great book called Winning the Story Wars by Jonah Sachs. It's, it's a great, a great um, book targeted at communicators and marketers about um, how to do good storytelling online. Uh, this is um, Rainforest. Rain, thank you, Rainforest Action Network. This is like just classic NGO stuff, isn't it? Right? Sad animal with a sad little baby in a clear cut. Some text on the screen. Nowhere left to go. Um, uh, but it's the third most popular overall post. As it happens at Web of Change, David Taylor was there. I spent some time in the hot tub next to David. And uh, we talked. This is someone who works at the Rainforest Action. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for that important piece of information in. Just not, not some guy named David Taylor. He had lovely quadriceps. Um, in any case, uh, I, uh, I was talking to David because we showed him some of this stuff because Rainforest Action Network is, is doing well. And he said, yeah, we spent three hours trying to think of what the text should go on that page um, or on this, uh, on this image. And so, you know, they worked hard at it. This seems like a good time. I'm sorry, we've just been at Web of Change, so all my, do you want to tell the Upworthy uh, story? Yeah, yeah so th there's this fantastic, fantastic website called upworthy.org, .org, Upworthy. Upworthy, a uh, bunch of really cool change makers and technologists got together and, and the United States and decided to create this site. Uh, they're on Facebook, they're huge on Facebook, uh, to sort of um, better educate people around online content and what we should be making go viral. Because it's sort of like, you know, you are what you eat, well, you are what you look at. So it started with that idea and they, and they also are really heavy into the, you know, trying to make change through viral content. I guess that's the elevator pitch. Anyways, we met uh, the uh, CTO of Upworthy uh, at this conference, and one of the things that he shared with us, they do a lot of graphics, put a lot of uh, text over graphics, um, and share a lot of video. For every graphic that they create for their social media channels, they, um, they basically write out 25 different headlines and they choose the best one. And that blew me away because here I am trying to create content for different uh, organizations on Facebook and it's sort of, well, you gotta think of the most creative thing that comes to your mind right away. They are disciplined about it. They have this incredible gap graphic. It, it, chances are it's gonna get, they're pretty popular right now, thousands of likes, shares, and comments. And in order to make sure that the quality is there, they will write 25 different headlines out. Yeah, uh, one of the founders, or the co-founders of Upworthy is from The Onion, and that's something, that's a practice The Onion started, of like writing 25 headlines, right? You go to The Onion, they're all funny, and that's part of the formula as they write. And, uh, and Upworthy really plays off satire, so it's... Yeah. Uh, one other question that I would like possibly answer, answered in the question period, you know, these are kind of popular now, these like images with text on top of them, right? Over the past 12 months or something, or even six months, they've gotten quite popular. Uh, I'm interested to hear later, what you call them inside your organizations, right? People call them infographics, and that makes us want to twist heads off because it's not really technically an infographic. Though it could be, that could be totally satisfactory because um, really what information is conveying it except that this baboon is sad. Um, but uh, so we call them web postcards. I just say pretty pictures be of text. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, is not, uh, so we call web postcards because they're things that get sent around and they're pictures with text on top of them, but anyway. Um, so if you have other names for them, we'd love to hear them. That's you. This is, we'll uh, say it, say it. Sorry, <laughs> this is another, this was the fourth most popular post we looked at. Um, it's by one of my favorite organizations, the National Audubon Society. Uh, bird watchers are hardcore on Facebook. And they posted this photo of a uh, prothonotory warbler. <laughs> Good work. Um, Prothonotory warbler uh, in a heart-shaped tree, and it just rocked it. It won. Yeah, it wasn't even on Valentine's Day. I think it was in April or something like that. It's 16 April. Uh, Animals and babies. Yeah, we don't. We don't. Perhaps there's something special about the Prothonotory warbler that we don't know. Perhaps that's the only one left in the United States or something. But um, in any case, we couldn't figure out why it was successful. 
And then um, again, back to Surf Rider, right? So a lot of you in the past year probably have seen this. It's a meme, a viral idea that gets spread from person to person. Um, and in this case, it's like about perceptions of your profession, right? You may not have seen one about surfers, but you may have seen it about audio engineers or, um, you know, I don't know, um, marketers or salesmen or a million different things, right? And so that's, you know, not overly complicated to do, but it, it was successful and, and made it into our top six. I mean, I, I should say one thing. You know, um, one thing that I've always felt were tr was true on social networks and blogs, of course, even more on blogs, is, you know, we're always crafting the best version of ourselves on these sites, right? We're always making the best version of ourselves. So when we reshare something like this, it's, it's, it's reinforcing one's identity as a surfer, uh, it, as a surfer who cares about other things, because of course it's from Surfrider. We're, we're um, also acknowledging that we're cool enough to share a meme, right? And that we're cool enough to make fun of ourselves too, right? So this is like, I think, um, you know, uh, you tell a story with yourself with each share, and I think this, this, is, this is something you can think about when looking at these top performers. And you know, I just I just want to point out I don't want to assume everybody knows what the word meme is in the room. Maybe you do. Maybe it's now mm -hmm. that is now common knowledge. But a meme is essentially something that's gone viral. It's it's been sort of extracted from cultural consciousness and risen above. So an example is, I mean, how often do you see a kitten photo on your Facebook wall? Like kittens have reached mm -hmm. meme status. Yeah, yeah. It's a, the, the official name uh, uh, definition is a virally transmitted piece of cultural information. So if I say like, oh, call me maybe, now it's all in your head, right? But that like that song is a meme. And, you know, any if I hum a tune and then somebody walks out and hums it, I've I've trans I've virally transferred that piece of information. Thank you for explaining. Yeah, no problem. Um, is it me or me next? Oh yes, yeah, this is just <laughs> this is also a meme. We just uh, we just made this because we thought it was funny and Eli looks incredibly. We creepy. thought it could be the next viral image yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> by Net Tuesday. Yeah, Thank you, Eli. Share, share that around. He's a sport. Yeah, he's good. Yeah. So um, we we've actually posted the stand closer. Okay. Closer to the um, sorry. Uh, sorry, Honolulu. Um, uh, we have we have posted the top ten posts. So uh, those are you saw images of the top six. You can actually we posted links to all ten um, at this URL j.mp slash ngofb posts, non-government organization Facebook posts, NGO Facebook posts. So you can actually view all 10 posts in context in Facebook. Now there is a very slight possibility that the organization has deleted one of these posts, why they would do that as it's a top performer for them. I would not know, but in theory one or two of those links would be, could be broken, but I don't think they are. And so um, now I want to tell a story. We, as I said, we presented the initial data back in, um, whatever that was, April. And um, Jody, what's Jody's last name, Eli? Stark. 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 Like Star or Stark? Stark. Stark, like Iron Man. Okay. Uh, so Jody Stark, she's the oceans campaigner, I think, at uh, the Davis Suzuki Foundation, was in the audience, and she uh, watched that and then, uh, watched our session. And the next day, she went into the office and, and produced this, which is about the Great Bear, um, the Great Bear Sea. Right, and how it's threatened by tankers and oil spills and that sort of thing. And it, you know, it's quite a simple graphic. Um, it's it's fine. Uh, there is no there are no cute animals in it. Certainly, um, it's super easy to make. But again, text on top of an evocative image. And this is a, a quote. Eli wrote a post about this later because she talked to Eli about it. And this is um, what she wrote about it. So we got a thousand post uh, shares, 180 comments, and 342 likes. Page was also liked a thousand more people this weekend. We can't attribute this to the image, I'm glad she's speaking scientifically, but we do know that with a thousand shares, we got huge exposure to lots of new Facebook friends. Uh, we'll go on to talk about visits to the blog, and et cetera, et cetera, but this is, I think, is the most proof point down here. So Facebook Insights, which is like the analytics, the statistics engine inside Facebook pages, um, the post is currently second out of 158 posts for engaged users and most talked about for 2012. So these are Facebook's own metrics, engaged users and most talked about, right? So um, who felt that like, that's awesome. She took the learnings from our session and put it into practice and kind of proved out the model in some, some way in a very um, straightforward way. So you can all go do that tomorrow on your Facebook pages. <laughs> you like, don't post that image if you're you know, doing children or you know, <laughs> something like that. But um, you get the idea, make your own image, put some text on top of it. So, you're laughing at me. Um, recommendations, we have uh, about 10 recommend eight recommendations and then we're wrapping it up. Um, so, 
um, you can read those yourself. You're probably not posting enough photos and videos. Photos and videos are hard, and getting good ones is difficult as well. But if you're like assessing your mix going forward or assessing where you put resources, you may want to shift that balance a little bit more and, and um, maybe engage with a photographer to produce some great photos once a year or once a quarter or something like that. And that, you know, that doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Photographers come at a lot of different price, point, price points and you get, can get cool images, right? The social web is certainly very image-driven image these days. Um, what are the two big kind of social networks that we've been talking about in the past year? Pinterest and Instagram, right? Both about really, really image-centric sharing images. Um, as we've said, simple evocative images with text overlaid. I know that sounds kind of uh, banal, but that's what it is. That's what it comes down to. Uh, link more often to the sites other than your own. If we haven't made that case to you yet, um, hear it now. 80-20 um, rule, cocktail party rule, talk to other people, deliver value. Acknowledge that you are a tiny little island in the ocean of the internet. And then um, it was interesting, I think in the top six images, you can just look yourself, but I think only one of those images included in the text said, please share, right? Like in the text, they said, please like and comment and share, as organizations often do. And you know, we parted ways with Upworthy about this. Yeah. Upworthy said, we ask every time, we ask every time for people to share and like us. You know? Um, I think, uh, just a note on that, it's, uh, with Upworthy, you're sort of, if you like them, you follow them, you're a fan of them, you're sort of signing them an invisible contract that you're going to push out their content mm -hmm. on their behalf, because that's essentially what they're asking you to do. Yeah. It's kind of more of part of their value offering or proposition yeah. or something, yeah. If you're not upworthy, though, it can come off as tacky. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we think uh, less is more in this case. And, you know, the, it's, it's obviously not essential to have a really winning, successful post, right? Um, if five of the six don't do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's a small data set, of course, but, um, yeah, I mean, go ahead. So the top three that uh, really, um, really won our hearts and won uh, one of the data, uh, is Earth Justice, Surfrider, and Rainforest Action Network. Follow them tonight. Become fans of them. Look at what they're doing and emulate them. Copy them. You know, look, what, what kind of ideas are they coming up with? 350.org was also, I think, up there as well as yep. another organization that I, I just visit every now and then to see what, uh, what their online community managers are doing. Uh, to recognize supporters. Inevitably, when you go to the page and then you go to the Surfrider's page, it'll be like 20 links to surfrider.org in the front page. And, but just no on balance and aggregate anyway. And just um, sort of a really big um, takeaway is generally speaking, how you act um, and perform and engage online, my guess, our guess is, our, I should say, guess is going to be that that's how you engage offline. Um, if you're constantly linking to yourself online and on your social media channels, that's going to tell me maybe something about how you engage with your offline supporters. So just keep that in mind. There's a balance. You, you want to um, uh, act as you want to act online just as you want to offline because it, it's probably, it reflects engagement across all channels and on all levels. Yeah, like Surfrider is famously an excellent organization. Uh, like volunteer management, organizing beach cleanups and offline events. It is no surprise that they're good at this stuff online too. And I actually really like this last finding, Darren. You sort of already talked about it mm -hmm. uh, with something that came out of Wildfire. Write different content for Facebook and Twitter and really all of your different online channels. As an online community manager, that makes me feel really good because you still need people to do that, to tell the story that complements the image and the content that you're putting out on social media. Um, it, a computer is not doing it yet. so. <laughs> Keep it, uh, keep it creative. Thank goodness, there are a bunch of people would be out of jobs. <laughs> uh, so that is, uh, that is our presentation. That is the presentation of the data. We um, also um, oversee people and teach people how to do this on a regular basis. So we're happy to answer questions specific to the data or more generally about what you should or should not do on the SOC meds, as we call them in house, the social media channels, the SOC meds. I encourage you all to say that. And I'd be curious, curious to hear, I'm trying to spread that as a meme. It's a hashtag, hashtag SockMed. Uh, hashtag sock, sock and it's important to put the K in SockMed. Um, and also, uh, if you have opinions on what you call those web postcard thingies, we'd be eager to hear that too. Questions, or yeah, let's clap first. <laughs> the front row is really intensely tweeting, have you noticed that? This is four right here. <laughs> 
question and then you can answer. Sure. Okay. <laughs> That's what I'm the next half hour. Okay. No. Um, yeah, so the question was, do, do these organizations um, do any kind of conversion stuff inside Facebook, right? Do they, uh, so conversion uh, metrics or conversion channels might be, um, you know, sign a petition, make a donation, buy our t-shirt, become a member, support our organization, these sorts of things, right? Um, are they like playing just with inside Facebook, or are they mostly or entirely sending people to their own web to their own website for that reason? I think every single post we looked at, if it was action oriented, sent them. Yeah, I mean, somewhere else. you know, it's 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 probable that these web these sites have other uh, these these pages have other tabs on them, right? I mean, my contemporary experience of Facebook pages is that like other tabs on site stuff. It's just in rapid decline. Yeah, I, 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 I haven't even talked about it in six months. Yeah, what to do yeah. with tabs. Yeah, so tabs used to be they used to be on the left, and there used to be other functional areas of Facebook that organization could control. And there was like a whole suite of products. And, and the, the timeline redesign, the recent timeline redesign, seems to have a serious impact. I think it's because Facebook wants to drive that action towards apps more. But An organization who uh, at one point used to do tabs and embed apps very, very well was World Wildlife Fund. I always would point to them, so that would be a good a good organization to turn to. Yeah, in the states. Yeah, yeah. So seeing what they're doing. Just the visibility of tabs, and when we've looked at, you know, we do a bunch of work with MEC, and they had they've had various tabs. It's kind of shocking how few people go to other tabs inside your Facebook page. It's a tiny amount of people, and so you know, our instinct based on and based on that that observation too is not to spend a lot of money building custom tabs and stuff inside Facebook. That we're inclined to drive people to our own site and we can control the experience more, it's more reliable. That's also investment, if it's on your own site, it's also investment that gets leveraged via your email newsletter and via other people blogging about you and, and uh, Twitter and so on and so forth, right? So, um, you know, what am I doing wrong? You, no? okay. um, but in any case, um, yeah, so does that answer your question? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So the question was, how are you measuring success when you're running uh, running social media channels, right? And you know, to to us, there are two layers to that particular onion. That you want to have broad business goals, right? And those business goals are around donations. They're around um, getting people to sign petitions or sign on as members. Or, I mean, sorry, that's actually one layer above that. Broad business goals are to uh, affect behavior change or get this piece of legislation passed or um, whatever. Right and or, or or fundraising and then then below that is you know goals related to your organization specific sorry uh, conversion tactics related to those goals so like as I said make a donation sign a petition sign up for our newsletter so on and so forth right below that is the layer of kind of social media statistics and these are in layers of importance as well right so <laughs> big picture be a picture small picture. Uh, Facebook Insights tell you how much in, how engaging content is. Um, you know, you can look at use a tool like Bitly or Hootsuite to track the number of um, clicks a link gets. Uh, we're not interested in that bottom level hardly at all. Like we're interested in kind of observing Facebook growth or observing follower growth over time, and that's useful to know. And it's mostly useful to know when it spikes or when it falls off. Right? Uh, it's kind of grow at a certain level, and then like, oh man, we did something great and this happened, or man, things have been in decline the last month, what's going on there, right? Um, 
we're, we mostly want to live in that middle layer where we have like actionable objectives. Some of those can happen inside Facebook, right? Um, mostly they don't for our organizations for one reason or another. Another, but you know, there's apps like Causes, and you can use. We've done petition tabs, you know, in the past, but um, most of it is about driving traffic through to your website and getting them to convert on those things there. So when you're reporting to your board about this, I would look at how much traffic did we get from Facebook, and did they, at what percentage did they convert, right? You know, we recently did a campaign this spring where we were. It was a really high friction campaign where. People came to the site and had like a five or six minute task to do. It was like a serious thing to do. And we were shocked that people who came from Twitter were amongst the highest conversion rate. So like you know, 10 or 12% of people compared to 3% on average or something from Twitter converted to do this quite intense task. I'll spare you the details of what the task was. But so that was a real like learning for us because I've always conceived Twitter as this like highly serendipitous, highly, you know, kind of um, fleeting river of news kind of thing, but here we actually discovered that, oh, you know, Twitter is a place where we can actually become engaged with people, or perhaps uh, the, these followers are really in, are really engaged. I mean, we'd have to test that theory again, but, you know. Did you have some? Sorry? It was this year. Can I ask what audience you're trying to reach? Sorry, I, I, I didn't hear all that. Are you targeting um, people who work in universities? Okay. Sure. Okay. So the, the question was, you can answer this if you want. Um, the question was, is Facebook right for every single NGO campaign or every single NGO um, program or, or every single NGO full stop? Instinct is to say no, but you you yeah. continue on with that. Sure. So um, one simple is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, was, I believe the correct answer. Um, ten points for Theo. Ten points for Gryffindor. Um, so um, are you more of a Slytherin, aren't you? Um, so oh, that's cruel. So we use this really well. We use a bunch of things, but one me simple methodology or starting place we start from when we think about web strategy is this thing from Forrester from a few years ago, which you may have heard of, called Post. People, objective, strategy, tactics. Tactics slash tools slash technology. Call it what you like. Um, people, objective, strategy, tactics. Post. Everyone's writing that down. I'll wait a moment. Post. Um, and that's, it's simple, but super useful. And, and they go in that order. That is the really key bit, is you start with the people. So you start with your audience analysis, right? Who are these people? Well, they're, um, I'm just going to say they're at UVic, because we went to UVic. Um, so these are university uh, employees at UVic. As it happens, uh, in the mid-90s when I was at UVic, one of my jobs, uh, for which I was surprisingly well paid, was to go around to every office on the university, every single office, and every single prof's individual office, and give him or her a recycling bin and explain what it was for, right? So this is kind of a social change, this is a behavior change campaign right there anyway. So, but they picked the right medium because Twitter didn't exist in 1995. In any case, um, so, so you're targeting uh, university people at a particular university. Um, you know, I want to know a little bit more. I don't want to have this conversation here. But um, if it was like a professional, if it was related to their professional work, like I might say, well, maybe you want to try LinkedIn and do some advertising on LinkedIn. Because you can hyper-target on LinkedIn, so you could target, I have to double check whether you could target graduates of a particular university. or No, you can target employees of a particular company. So you could, you could do that. Likewise, you can do that inside Facebook. You can uh, do advertising inside Facebook to just target employees or people associated with a particular university. So you could do that. Um, the answer always here, the irritating answer is always test, right? Like try some things and test them, right? It's not gonna cost you a lot of money to advertise on Facebook and LinkedIn because there's so few people you're targeting, so you're not gonna get many clicks. But you can try that for a few weeks and test it and see if it works, uh, right? Daryl likes to say, take, you know, take a whole bunch of stuff and throw it against the wall and see what sticks. Yeah. So you, you don't wanna put all your eggs in one basket in the Facebook basket, you wanna, as he's saying, test against all these different channels and see what starts working for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
that's, a, that's an excellent follow-up question. The question, the follow-up question was, how do you know when you're not using the medium correctly compared to when the medium is not right for you? That is a hard question to answer. Um, uh, well, though, I think my, uh, my clever retort is that it doesn't matter because you're going to stop using the medium in either case, right? So, um, no, that's true. I think I've stopped doing that on a number of occasions, right? Because um, if something's not working for you, stop doing it, right? Um, you, could, you know, you want to test some different tactics, too. Some examples like Google Plus. Is Google Plus working for you? Yeah, right. Almost certainly no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Chances um, are it's not working for anyone else right. either. Well, a few nerds. Um, so, um, no offense to anybody who loves Google+. Plus. Um, so, yeah, so I, sorry, I had a little something to add there. Test, 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 throw it against the wall. Yeah, throw it against the wall. Feel free to admit that, like, we are a decade or, like, maybe no more than 12, 15 years into web marketing, right? Which is just in its infancy. And the conversation, every time we work with a client, we have a conversation about risk, right? And about how, you know, we have a lot of experience with this, but stuff is, this stuff is risky. This is not, um, well, even running ads on television is risky, right? Because you need to make a good ad. But um, this stuff is unpredictable, and so you always have to take the attitude of like, uh, from like the world of software startups, you know, uh, fail fast and iterate rapidly, right? So, or I should say those reverse. Iterate rapidly, right? Test, 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 and then fail fast. When you discover something's not working, stop doing it and do some other things, right? And, um, you know, it may be very, very true that the best possible outcome is to send some student around, every single pr professor and, and employee at the university, and just have that person talk to them for five minutes about what the issue is, right? And, and you know, forget about Facebook or Twitter. I don't know. And see, how, see if anybody else is doing the same thing you're doing and they're doing it well. Yeah, steal from other places in other countries. We do that all the time. All the time. Yeah. Uh, another question. Yes, over there. Yeah, so the question is, um, some of the images we saw were of a uh, professional quality and some were amateur, and, and overall, when you look at the stuff that's on the web and it's popular, thank you, um, uh, it, it varies. Um, I, there's a thing I like to say, which is that funny beats slick every time, right? So um, a, a great, uh, a, a, an emotion, and it's actually emotional beats slick every time, so an emotionally moving image, right, beats uh, professionalism every single time, and this has been through since the early days of the web, right? Like, a lot of the early blogs were ugly ass sites, but they became, you know, Boing Boing was ugly when it started. And it, uh, but it, it was, you know, CNN and other properties were a lot bigger, but there was, it still found a space and grew and grew and grew. So, no, I, I don't really think there is a correlation. Um, and I, I still think that's true. I think um, you can, uh, there, hmm. I, I want to make it as professional as I could in most cases, right? Uh, well, no, I think it's, I'm sorry, I'm retracting that. It's a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, I don't know what you think, but I feel like, you know, like, for example, is if you're, if you're featuring a supporter photo, like somebody um, stood witness to some uh, police brutality in Central America or something like that, and they took a photo, and it was a bad photo, but you're not going to doctor it, right, or crop it, or, like, you know, apply an Instagram filter to it, because it's truth, right? And so you might put some text on top of it, so it's, can convey its image and convey the context for what's happening, but that's going to run as it is. But in another case, um, you know, uh, in, as we saw here, pro pro professionally producing the, the image is good. You know, I would go back to the meaning you're trying to convey, the story you're trying to tell, the thing you're trying to explain or convey, and, and see, um, and can just kind of test that against your own, um, against your own best instincts, because we don't have any data to assess whether they're, you can look at the top 10 to see if you, you see any more correlation there, but I don't know if you have anything to add. Less is more, and to sort of play off your cocktail party rule, mm -hmm. you can tell when someone's being fake in front of you or trying to doctor up their life a little bit, make it a little more shiny. Sometimes just putting up a photo, I'm gonna pick on Tara Shear here, who's that, from BC Children's Hospital and runs all the digital media there. She's at the hospital. She has an opportunity to go uh, and witness uh, an exchange between a parent and this child. She snaps a photo. She puts it up on Facebook. It, 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 those are the number one most engaging posts each year on our Facebook channel. And, uh, no offense, but she's not a professional photographer? No. no okay. Sorry, yeah. Tara. Yeah. Not? No, but you know, she, she, she caught the moment, and it's genuine, so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, yes. From the cloud. From the cloud. <laughs> uh, that's great. Right. So oh, Mechanical yeah, Turk. Yeah. Mechanical Turk is confusing. Uh, so you Google Amazon Mechanical Turk, yeah. and you'll find it as an Amazon product. Okay. I, I have not looked closely at this, and perhaps um, one of you with internet connectivity, could one of you can uh, please do the following Google search? Watch, I'm outsourcing a task right now. Um, <laughs> Could you search for Mechanical Turk Twitter Raven, like the bird, right? Mechanical Turk Twitter Raven. Twitter recently rolled out, like, basically a, a better interface than Mechanical Turk to make it simpler for more people to use, because Twitter uses Mechanical Turk for reasons which I don't think they share, um, but they use them probably to evaluate whether or not reported tweets are actually spam or, um, like, uh, pornographic or things like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so. If you find, you should find a link to maybe the developer's blog on Twitter, which will name the, I think it's called Black Raven, which seems, Clockwork. what's it called? Clockwork. Clockwork Raven, thank you, because Black Raven would be quite redundant, wouldn't it, yeah. Um, so Clockwork Raven, you can add that into the mix of Amazon Turk. The cost, you can set the cost yourself. For this task, um, so you can um, have an ethical debate with yourself as to how, how little you want to pay the workers of the world. And I should say, we get the time zone and we get the, yeah, we get the time zone of where these people work. So, um, and the average length it takes them to do it. And the average length, you get a bunch of fascinating data back. So these are not all people in the developing world. Of probably of the thousand posts we had looked at, half of those were done by workers in the United States or in the Eastern time zone, I'd say. Um, so um, so we, we paid 20 cents a 20 cents per hit. That's and hit stands for human intelligence tasks. Yeah, human, that's one of these individual human intelligence tasks. And the average length of those tasks was, I think, two minutes or something like that, a minute and a half? I think it was just over a minute. Yeah, so if you do the and math. And different, different workers have different track records. Yeah. So we can. You can actually filter. I only want workers who are like B and A workers. Level five. Can, yeah, yeah, and they're going to cost more, right? But you can set that price yourself. But if nobody accepts the task, then you set the price too low. Mm -hmm. So it's this kind of magic math. And I just thought, like, okay, well, I'm going to pay them six bucks an hour. So, uh, you know, and that's, that's 20 cents a, you know, um, that's 20 cents a hit, and people do it faster. It's, you know, it's a weird, strange world. And the onus is on us to vet their work. So yeah. if they're not doing it properly, and they wouldn't always do it properly, yeah. and we had to start and stop and go and stop and go a bit. Um, and and we, we did some thorough data cleaning at the end, yeah. too. Cool. Yeah. yeah. We probably looked every post. I, I probably looked every post at the end. Uh, at the end, there nearly every one of them. So, uh, so you can reject hits that weren't working out and uh, then reward yeah. those. It's kind work? of a complicated process to do, but if you've got some cool project, um, I, you know, there's just like it's, there's endless possibility of Amazon Turk. Uh, one of my favorite art projects on the web is uh, a guy paid 10,000 Amazon Turk workers to um, draw a sheep. Right? He built a little interface on the computer and he just asked them each to draw a sheep, and then he had 10,000 sheep, which he built into a weird web page. <laughs> anyway, it was, cool. it was an art project. Yeah, it was totally cool, right? So if you want a, a thousand people to draw a sheet, well, there's a, there's a tool out there for you. Um, yes? Just a, just a slice on the day. We just looked at 50 most recent posts um, and the data on that day. Because, of course, each of these posts, as I expect, sorry, the question was, how did we kind of gather the data and what was the time on? Because each of these posts is obviously collecting likes and shares over time. And so the new ones would naturally, in theory, um, and we didn't look at this, but it, it's not that necessarily true. Um, I, should, I should sort the data by that to see if the newer posts have, on average, less likes and shares than the older posts. But we figured on balance, if we we're doing exactly the same thing with all, fi uh, with all 20 organizations, that it would be roughly the same period of time and roughly the same kind of decay or rather uh, um, uh, accretion, uh, gathering, collecting of likes, comments, and shared for each organization. So it was apples to apples. So um, I would say it's not a perfect date, the perfect approach, but it was, I, I felt reasonably confident in it, I guess. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Uh, come talk to me afterwards. How about that? Yeah. Um, over in the corner. Uh, this is our last question. This is our last question? Okay. Thank you. Can 
you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this um, young woman is explaining that maybe she's a young woman. Uh, very yeah. white here. Very pretty young woman is explaining that she uh, she's wanting to post a link uh, and lead people somewhere, and she's doing that, but then she's overriding the link with a larger photo mm -hmm. to grab people's attention. And I do it all the time, and my answer to that is. It, is it worth it? Because are you losing the people maybe, I think this is your question, are you losing the people going to the link? It, I think it depends on what, what you're, where the link takes you. Like, are you driving them to a campaign page to take action? And if so, I think, I mean, hands, uh, hands down, the photo is at least going to get the attention that will lead to the link. I, I don't know, Darren, what do you think? Uh, I just, I have just been advising for the last year, always, always Trump with a photo or a video to support the link. Um, and, and it's just been, in my experience, and this data sort of backs it up, that the photo and video will always outperform the link. Um, that's not to say, though, that you shouldn't have a nice balance of content. So when, I, when I'm working for an organization, I'm setting up all your uh, content for that week, and I'm scheduling it through Hootsuite dashboard, the most amazing dashboard if you're not using it yet. Um, I may have one link in there that, you know, cbc.ca, post a little uh, thumbnail image and a link, and that's it. But I will always try and prioritize the, the photo. I want to add one related note. Um, for both Facebook, what I see, I see organizations and companies all the time doing this too. They'll launch like microsites or new campaign sites. And um, for both Facebook and Pinterest, when you go to post it, when you go to share it or, mm -hmm. or pin it, mm -hmm. um, the, there are no uh, Facebook and Pinterest friendly images for it to grab because the whole thing's a map or it's flash or it's probably not flash anymore. But anyway, you can actually tell your designers and developers should know this. You can tell Facebook and Pinterest in the header of the page, pick this image to go with the, um, you know, as the thumbnail and Pinterest to pick this image. Um, so you can kind of serve that by default, which is just a nice little trick when you're uh, running pages like that. Um, so I wrote an article that has, um, you've heard a longer version of what this article has, but this is um, uh, on Greenpeace's Mobilization Lab. I just found it by Googling Mobilization Lab Darren Barefoot, and you'll find this article. Um, we have business cards down here if you would like them, and uh, I believe, and we'll be here around afterwards for questions and uh, compliments on our shoes. And you can find Thanks. us on Facebook and Twitter. You can find us on Facebook and the Twitter. Uh, thanks very much, everybody. I didn't lie. I told you these people were good people. Look at them. Well, you know, they're smart, they're clever, and good shoes. Basically, they shame the rest of you. So <laughs> we're, of course, not actually done. Um, it's September. It's a new year. We're feeling punchy. So uh, we're going to totally do a second event this year, um, this month. So we're going to bring it actually in like two weeks or something. Whatever. It's coming terrifyingly soon. We're going to be bringing in some friends from TechSoup Canada in Toronto. Um, and they're going to talk a little bit about nonprofits in the cloud. And it sounds dreamy and delightful. Um, and also, this is your chance to go and talk with staff from TechSoup Canada. So if you've got like some software donation thing that you're grumpy about, if you've got some kind of question, if there is something that is missing from their catalog and you think they should know about it, this is your chance to come, learn, and be sassy. So uh, this is also where you get to share a little bit with your community. So I'm going to ask you guys to line up here by the side of the stage. Um, if you've got something you're working on right now, some cool project, and you can talk about that thing in 30 seconds, I'd like you to uh, come join us right now. and. Uh, and get the attention of like 100 of Vancouver's most engaged, connected, passionate people. So uh, you shouldn't be shy, because honestly, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. You should get in on this thing. So let's do this thing. Here we go, here we go. And we're just going to come right here into the camera zone. Camera, in the mic. 
Okay, my name is Jared Lee. I'm the marketing uh, sort of fundraising partnerships director for Peace Geeks. Peace Geeks is a nonprofit organization based in Vancouver. We are a global movement to empower nonprofits and NGOs in the developing world uh, by leveraging technology to connect volunteers remotely uh, to work on projects for technology, communications, and project management. So that's a lot of web development, graphic design, that sort of thing. If you want to check us out, peacegeeks.org. And we'll also be hosting a Random Hacks event at the end of November, first weekend of December, here in Vancouver. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sonia Yonke, and I work for Ashoka Changemakers. And that's a great organization, and we have a great initiative that we are part of called BC Ideas. It's $250,000 for great ideas that impact social change in BC. So if you have a great idea and what you're working on is within the province, you're eligible for some of this funding. Our deadline is tomorrow, so if you're really interested, <laughs> it's 5 p.m. tomorrow. So if you have a lot of coffee tonight and you're really inspired by this presentation and you want to enter, I'm here afterwards if you'd like my personal card or you want to talk about your entry or anything like that, I'm here to speak with you guys, and there's pamphlets at the front if you want to catch the website, which is bcideas.ca. Hi, everybody. My name is Wally Mitchell, and I work for an organization, or not work for, volunteer for an organization called Global Peace Network Canada. And we work with a um, uh, community in uh, Tanzania, and we do um, both education, so we help uh, put uh, street kids through school, and we also have just opened a uh, medical clinic and dispensary in the, uh, in the region. It's been a long haul, but we're uh, finally putting it all together, so um, that's us. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Derek. I'm with Union Gospel Mission. We're doing a project called the East Side Stride, which is a part um, of one of our goals is to help uh, the downtown East Side be a beloved part of Vancouver. And so it's kind of a history tour slash uh, just, it's a tour. It's a, it's a pretty cool tour. It's happening during Homelessness Action Week, which is October 8th, the week of October 8th. We're also, if you can actually do the tour, which you can find information about on UGM.ca, if uh, you can't be on the tour, we've made like a non-native app that you can, you can do the tour with by yourself too. And uh, we need feedback on it. So um, yeah, UGM.ca. to say hello. Um, my whole background has been in the nonprofit sector, but just a few months ago I started a new gig and now I do recruitment for the nonprofit sector. So if you're somebody who wants to work in the nonprofit sector and could be a great candidate for me in a leadership position, I'd love to meet you. And if you're a nonprofit and you need to hire for a leadership position, I'd also love to talk to you. Um, my name is Paula Baca, and I am privileged to be co-chairing the 2012 UBC Community United Way campaign. Uh, UBC is the largest employer in the Lower Mainland. We're poised to try to raise $650,000 this year for United Way of the Lower Mainland. Um, we're just embarking on a lot of social media campaigns, and we're trying to figure out what's going to stick, everything from paper forms right down to Twitter and whatnot. So, um, very exciting. Uh, a huge plug for the United Way of the Lower Mainland. I also know that um, colleagues here from the uh, BC Children's Hospital Foundation are up here somewhere, and so high five to you because I love your stuff. Thank you. He actually has a stopwatch. Uh, my name is Chris Brandt. I'm the ED at Music Heals. We're working on a lot of projects, but the one you can help us with is we're doing an iPod pharmacy. Since your iPod is sitting in a drawer gathering dust, we're giving it to music therapists. They can give it to someone who's sitting on dialysis for three hours a day, listen to their favorite songs, get them through what they're doing. Musicheals.ca, send your iPods through. Nice to you, Don Chris. Mine's about alcohol. Come and drink with some fundraisers this Thursday at 820 Berard at Joey's Great Networking. And by the way, I'm Siobhan Aspinall from BCIT. Woo. Can I use some of your time? Uh, I'm Aj 
Ajay with East Fan Love. It's a volunteer based group, and I'm here representing Kimmy and Jules as well. Um, how many people love East Fan? Woo. Well, we're going to have a tweet up part of Social Media Week, which is the last week of September, actually the same week as that on the 27th at Toby's. And feel free to come and have drinks, it's free. And yeah, just get to meet other people in East Fan that tweet and not tweet. So, September 27th, uh, East Fan Love. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Laura Smith from TechSoup Canada, and Eli already plugged the wonderful event coming up, but if you have questions about TechSoup Canada, um, feel free to come up and ask me. Uh, just to let you know, we offer do uh, donated software from 28 corporate donors if you are a registered charity or nonprofit. so happy to tell you about it. And I was also at Web of Change, and it was great to meet all these guys, so thank you. So this long slog is almost over. Thank you so much for your patience. So I still have food. And I don't know what to do with it. But I bet you guys can totally help me out. So there's two things that are going on now as we wrap this up. One, we're going to hang out for half an hour, chat, and uh, I don't know, share gossip, talk to recruiters, all kinds of great stuff. Um, the other thing is, I would love for three of you guys to hang out at the end of that half hour period and just give me 10 minutes to make these chairs go away onto the rack. That'll make us popular and our friends at the venue will invite us back again. Thank you so much.